Now, going to the issue of therapeutics, which I said is now increasingly the focus of our cancer uh, symposia over the last decade, uh, we were aware, and, and I believe Louis Chodosh mentioned this already, that in fact many existing therapies uh, result in the elimination of the non-stem cells in a, in a population of treated carcinoma cells, allowing the survival of the uh, stem cells, which are more resistant to therapy. And here one sees this in a schematic way. Here's a population of uh, cells within a tumor. Here are the stem cells and the non-stem cells. As one has observed in several different um, human carcinoma types, treatment with a variety of conventional therapeutics results in the ablation effectively of the non-stem cells in the collapse of the overall tumor size, i.e. debulking, but the survival of, in fact, a population of uh, stem cells which live to the day when they can begin to regenerate the tumor uh, once the therapy is lifted. And so in order to address this, uh, Tamir Onder uh, produced a population of cells which he had uh, put, placed constitutively in a mesenchymal state through the shutdown of ECAD here in, and here I just give you indications of this through the acquisition of Vimentin, for example, and N-cadherin. And then he and Piyush Gupta began to uh, examine whether these cells, which had been made mesenchymal and thus uh, having a stem cell phenotype, uh, were also, uh, might also be used as reagents with which one could detect compounds that could preferentially kill putative stem cells rather than non-stem cells. And the, the great bulk of this work then proceeded not in my own laboratory, but in the laboratory uh, adjacent at the Broad Institute of Eric Lander and in the hands of Piyush Gupta. And here I describe his work in which uh, they first began to examine the effects of two conventionally used th th therapeutics, doxorubicin and paclitaxel. In this case, I bring your uh, attention to the fact that the blue represents the behavior of uh, non-stem cells, uh, non-cancer stem cells. The red represents the behavior of cancer stem cells that have been forced through an EMT. And here, looking at increasing drug concentrations, one sees, as advertised, that the non-stem cells with these two conventional therapeutics, the non-stem cells die uh, or are killed off at about one order of magnitude lower drug concentration than the putative stem cells for both of these reagents. Um, Piyush Gupta then proceeded to screen 16,000 compounds uh, in the library that they had then at the Broad for those uh, compounds that might preferentially kill the, uh, the putative stem cells. And here uh, they, they found 22, of which two were examined in detail because of the availability of the drugs. Selenomycin and abamectin, they're both used as antiparasitics, actually in animal feed. So the next time you eat a hamburger at McDonald's, you may be having, ingesting a wee bit of this. It's rather innocu innocuous, selenomycin. But um, just uh, to return to our theme, um, it, it is able to kill off the cancer stem cells at about eight to tenfold lower drug concentration than the non-stem cells. So it acts in, in the converse uh, way. And here, uh, I give you more evidence of that. Here is a population of, uh, of um, these um, breast cancer cells, 95% in the non-stem cell position, 5% in the stem cell position. If one treats them with paclitaxel, a taxol analog, and one greatly reduces their overall number. But among the surviving cells, 70% now are stem cells, and the remaining 30% are non-stem cells, uh, in, in, in consonance with what I mentioned before. Conversely, selenomycin um, resulted in uh, the presence of only 0.2% of the surviving cells having the stem cell uh, antigenic phenotype, with the great majority, 99%. 0.8% having the non-stem cell uh, phenotype. So uh, none of us is interested in portraying this as the answer to cancer in terms of a, this being a precursor to drugs that might be clinically useful, if only because uh, the generation, the formation of clinically useful drugs is extraordinarily complex and dictated by a whole variety of parameters that we're not equipped to deal with here. What, what I mention is only to indicate the fact that one can, with relative facility, screen for compounds that can preferentially kill cancer stem cells rather than uh, non-stem cells. Still, uh, one can pose the answer, the question, is this really the answer to cancer? In other words, by getting rid of the cancer stem cells, will one indeed succeed in getting rid of tumors? And here I uh, refer to the work of Christine Chaffer. She was working with immortalized human mammary epithelial cells which are essentially identical biologically to normal human mammary epithelial cells. And she discovered there were floating cells in, this, in, the, in the Petri dishes. Uh, now, we all know in this room here that floating cells are dead and should be dumped. But she didn't know that. So she took these cells 
and she put them in an, another petri dish, and lo and behold, they, they re-adhered and started growing vigorously. She called these cells flopsies for floating populations of cells, um, and um, discovered that they had stable phenotypic uh, differences from the parental population. Uh, morphologically, they're different. They express different um, cytokeratins. They express greatly different levels of cell surface epithelial surface antigen. Um, and uh, they have a much higher proportion, naturally, a naturally resident subpopulation of the CD44 high uh, stem cell-like cells. And they maintain this uh, phenotype and culture rather stably. Of some interest is the fact that she generated then single cell clones from these flopsies, these floating populations of cells. For example, single cell clones that are CD44 high or CD44 low. Uh, here are some of these clones. Interestingly, all of the populations had um, a minority population with a stem cell-like um, immunophenotype. And that suggests the possibility that if one looked hard enough in the Petri dish of all epithelial cells in culture, it's possible that there are stem cell-like cells that naturally reside as subpopulations of propagated stem cells uh, in vitro. Again, I, I make that as a speculation rather than as a proof. Uh, clearly, uh, these cells behaved in one respect like stem cells. Here, the CD44 high cells generate CD44 low, more differentiated cells. And this is in consonance with our preconception that stem cells should differentiate to yield non-stem cells. She followed the fates of these various uh, single cell clones uh, over a period of 12 days. And what she discovered was, as I just mentioned, the CD44 high cells generated CD44 low cells, these little red dots here. And that was indeed anticipated. But conversely, she did not anticipate the following that the CD44 low cells, the non-stem cells, with the passage of time generated an increasingly large subpopulation of CD44 high stem-like cells. And uh, clearly the, the most uh, direct explanation of this is that there was a contaminating subpopulation of stem-like CD44 high cells from the very beginning of this experiment. But this, um, th this explanation is, uh, is embarrassed by the fact that in fact the stem cells actually proliferate more slowly than the non-stem cells. And it makes it hard to argue that the reason why this population emerged was that these red cells progressively outgrew uh, the, the larger population of non-stem cells. Um, and, and this has been done uh, time and again. Another way of addressing this is to mix CD44 high cells with uh, CD44 low cells in equal numbers. Uh, the orange cells are CD44 high initially. The black cells are CD44 low. Follow them over a period of 15 days. The proportion of the initial CD44 high cells in the population as a, of tissue culture cells as a, whole, as a whole goes down progressively because I just advertised that they grow more slowly than the non-stem cells. Conversely, the CD44 low cells begin to generate an increasingly large proportion of CD44 high cells. Um, and, and so uh, we believe that this is actually a, a process that occurs naturally uh, in the Petri dish. Um, and it, its uh, frequency depends on uh, the state of the cell. Uh, the, the parental population generates these CD44 high cells very slowly, but with increasing introduction of transforming oncogenes, the rate with which the CD44 high cells uh, occur, uh, are generated in, spontaneously in culture, increases. Here's her collaboration with Paul Wiggins, in which they calculated that per cell generation, cells which just have telomerase in them generate, uh, uh, per cell generation, this many uh, CD44 high cells. If you put in, if one puts in the SV40 uh, early region, that one doubles the rate of this spontaneous generation, and if one puts in the RAS oncogene on top of that, one doubles it again. So one can perturb uh, the rate with which this occurs spontaneously in culture, and moreover, if one looks at these various populations and transforms them subsequently through the introduction of other oncogenes, one discovers, for example, that the CD44 uh, high cell, the, that the CD44 high cells that are initially CD44 high prior to transformation now generate tumors which have as many as three or 400 metastases, whereas the parental cell population that did not derive from flopsies but has the same set of introduced oncogenes that generates uh, no uh, such um, uh, metastases at all. This, by the way, is also a, a rather stark demonstration that the differentiation state of normal cells prior to their undergoing a neoplastic transformation is a very important determinant of the metastatic potency post-transformation. Uh, moreover, if one transforms the CD44 high cells uh, uh, and then looks for the frequency of tumor-initiating cancer stem cells, it's actually about a thousand-fold more concentrated, the tumor-initiating cells, than if one transforms the parental population. 
So uh, once again, there's a strong um, e effect, influence of the pre-existing differentiation program on the subsequent beh behavior of the resulting neoplastic transformed cells. The CD44 high cells, as one might anticipate, when implanted into uh, mouse stromal fat pads, uh, these are human cells, so they form only these minimal ducts, but nonetheless, these are indicative of stem celledness. If one takes all this together, uh, that is to say, these observations of Christine Chaffers of the um, spontaneous formation of CD44 high cells, if one then assimilates also the notion that uh, stromal, um, the stromal cells seem to induce cancer stem cells to undergo, in, uh, cancer cells to undergo an EMT, as is indicated here, and the fact that the EMT produces cells with a stem cell-like uh, phenotype and indeed uh, biological um, behavior, then one comes to realize that in fact this diagram needs to be redrawn and that there is, depending on the biological context, a spontaneous de-differentiation and that there's much, less, much more plasticity than one might have imagined in these populations. And this, and it is my last slide, sir. <laughs> Thank you for that subtle hint. Um, and, um, <laughs> Now, this is ultimately the desired outcome if one were to eliminate uh, cancer stem cells from a tumor. Removal of the stem cells, and then the whole tumor will melt away. But now I would suggest that we are confronting a more complex scenario, because it may well be the case that if one succeeds, succeeds in eliminating the cancer stem cells with an agent like, for example, selenomycin, that the surviving non-stem cells will spontaneously regenerate, de novo, new stem cells that will go on to regenerate, in turn, a large and, and vigorously growing tumor. So this complicates the, how one thinks about uh, getting rid of stem cells and non-stem cells and tumor therapeutically. The work was done by a group of unusually good-looking people, as you can see here, many of whose names I've mentioned. Again, thank you for having me.